So our second speaker is uh, Silver Bronzo from the Higher School of Economics in Moscow, and his title is Assertion and Composition. Thank you. Before I start, I would really like to thank uh, Professor Ekanati for uh, this invitation. It is a great honor for me to speak at this institution and in, this, and in the context of this great conference. So I will start with... Uh, <clears throat> a quote from Russell's Principles of Mathematics. He writes, it is plain that if I may be allowed to use the word assertion in a non-psychological sense, the proposition P implies Q, which in his language is just a material conditional, asserts an implication, though it does not assert P or Q. The P and the Q which enter into this proposition are not strictly the same as the P or the Q, which are separate propositions. And Colin Johnston, in a paper on assertion in Wittgenstein's Tractatus, um, comments uh, in this way. In reasoning from the fact that P implies Q does not assert that P, to the claim that the P that occurs in P implies Q is not asserted, Russell tacitly assumes that if the P which enters into P implies Q were to assert that P, then so too would P implies Q. And he says, this is a substantial assumption, suggesting that Russell thinks of assertion as quite different from reference. It is normal to suppose with Frege that a referring expression may occur within another without the letter thereby referring to the referent or the former. And here Johnston, I think, makes an interesting point. He draws a connection which is uh, seldom drawn, namely a connection between, on the one hand, the question of the necessity of the force content distinction, at least in order to account for truth functional embedding. And on the other hand, uh, the question of which model of logical composition we should apply to propositional embedding. And I want to explore this connection today, and I have three specific goals. First, I want to discuss and criticize the view considered by Johnston, namely the view that forceful, forceful propositions embed on the model of reference. And I'm going to argue that Russell was right in assuming that uh, this view is wrong. Then I want to contrast this view with a more dominant view, according to which forceless propositions embed on the part whole model. And then I want to propose a third model of composition, which is based on the account uh, to which uh, Professor Ekanati was uh, referring before, Namely, a model of composition according to which simulations of forceful propositions, which are neither forceful nor truth viable, embed on the part whole model. Okay, my starting point is to go back to Frege and uh, his distinction between two models of logical composition, one applying to sense and one applying to reference. He writes, we can regard the sentence as a mapping of a thought. Corresponding to the whole part relation of a thought and its parts, we have, by and large, the same relation for the sentence and its parts. But things are different in the domain of reference. We cannot say that Sweden is part of the capital of Sweden. So if we take the expression, the capital of Sweden, its sense for Frege is a complex whole which features the senses of the parts of the expression as its own parts. So it's a whole which is composed of the sense of the functional expression, the capital of, and the sense of the proper name Sweden. Whereas the reference of the complex expression is Stockholm, which does not include either Sweden or the function the capital of as its own parts. Similarly, if we go up at the sentential level, 
the capital of Sweden is charming. This is a, this ex, the sense of this expression is a thought which is composed of the senses of the capital of Sweden and is charming, composed as its own parts. But uh, the reference of this is for Frege the true. And you know, neither Sweden nor Stockholm nor the function is charming is part of the true. The true is an object in its own right. And again, the same if we go up at the level of truth functionally complex sentences uh, to take the simplest case negation, the capital of Sweden is not charming. Again, the reference of this is the false and the true is not a part of the false. But the thought expressed by the capital of Sweden is charming is a part of the thought expressed by the capital of Sweden is not charming. So in the case of reference, we have the idea of a succession of stages where later stages carry no memory of the previous stages. I, I use uh, Sweden to refer to Sweden, but I use it uh, just as an intermediate step in order to eventually refer to Stockholm. And when I refer to Stockholm, there is no memory in that of the fact that I refer to Sweden. Whereas in the case of sense is different for Frege. The part whole model expresses the fact that um, the composition of sense reveals the inner nature or structure of sense. Whereas the composition of reference does not reveal the inner nature of or structure of reference. You know, I can refer to Socrates as a teacher of Plato, but you know, this does not, you know, Plato is not, you know, part of the structure of Socrates. Now, Frege talks about parts and holes in relation to sense. And how should we understand this talk? Because, you know, senses for Frege are abstract entities outside of space and time. And uh, how can they be said to have parts? And Frege acknowledges this and he says, to be sure we really talk figuratively when we transfer the relation of whole and part to thought. Yet the analogy is so ready to hand and so generally appropriate that we are hardly ever bothered by the hitches which occur from time to time. So according to Frege, the talk of part and, and uh, Holds has its primary home in connection with spatial or temporal entities, which have spatial parts or temporal segments. Now, how can this talk be applied to thoughts which lack, which are not in space nor in time? And I suggest that the reason why the analogy is, as Frege puts it, so generally appropriate is that it captured this non-figurative idea. Namely that expressing our understanding the sense of a complex linguistic expression involves, in virtue of the very nature of this sense, expressing or understanding the senses of the parts of the linguistic expression. So you cannot uh, either express or understand the sense of the capital of Sweden without expressing or understanding the sense of, for instance, Sweden. Okay, now I want to show how the part whole model when applied to sense at the level of uh, sentences and the composition of complete sentences lead to an apparent paradox. I will call it the paradox of negation. And I want also to show how we don't get the similar paradox when we are at the level of the composition of reference as Frege construes it or at the level of the composition of subsentential senses. And I will make some comments about why we don't get the same paradox at, the, at, at these other levels. So consider this little exchange. So A says, the capital of Sweden is charming. And B objects, what do you want to refer to? To Sweden or to Stockholm or to the true? 
Make up your mind. And the objection doesn't really have a force here. It seems that we can respond, well, in a sense, I want to refer to all of these things, but there is no need of making up my mind. I want to refer to Sweden as an intermediary step toward referring to Stockholm, as an intermediary step toward finally referring to the truth. Now consider a similar objection applied to the composition of subsentential senses, which for Frege composed on the part whole model. So A says uh, Stockholm is charming. And suppose B objects. Which sense do you want to express? The sense of Stockholm or the sense of is charming or the sense of Stockholm is charming? Make up your mind. And here, you know, we can respond, well, I want to express all of these senses, but there is no need of making up my mind. I want to express the senses of the two subsentential expressions as parts of the sense of the whole sentence. But when we move up at the level of complete sentences, at the level of, thought, of senses which are thoughts for Frege, I think we find something different. So A says, Stockholm is not charming. And B objects, which sense do you want to express? The sense of Stockholm is charming or the sense of Stockholm is not charming? Make up your mind. And here the objection does seem to have some grip, at least to the extent of being a puzzle, a prima facie puzzle. So I will formulate this puzzle in, in the form of a paradox. I will call it the paradox of negation, according to which to think or say that not P is also, among other things, to think or say that P that follows from the part whole model of composition. So it turns out that it seems that any act of negation is self-contradictory, which is a paradox. Okay, so why don't we find the same problem at the level of reference or subsentential senses? Well, part of the reason I think is that reference and subsentential senses are simply different from one another. Whereas sentential senses stand in logical relations and can be logically incompatible. Now, Stockholm and Sweden do not contradict each other. It's one is one object, the other is another object. So the true and the false. So subsentential senses, the sense of Stockholm and the sense of his charming are just two different senses. They don't either, they are neither compatible nor logically incompatible. But we find these relations of compatibility or incompatibility in terms of possibilities of contradictions when we go up at the level of sentential senses. Okay, now I want to discuss two strategies for responding to the paradox of negation. And the first strategy is the most common one, I think, is the strategy of distinguishing force and content. So, the response to the apparent paradox here is just that uh, it uh, trades on an equivocation on the terms uh, thinking and saying. We must distinguish according to this strategy two senses of these terms, one forceful and one forceless. So when I judge or assert not P, Part of what I'm doing is entertaining or expressing the thought that P and also judging and asserting that not P. But there is no inconsistency between these different attitudes or linguistic performances. So that's the straightforward response to the paradox given by the force content distinction. And I would like to say here that um, this shows that there is an argument in Frege for the force content distinction, which um, follows directly from his conception of a part whole composition of senses. There has been a discussion recently about what, what is Frege's argument for the force content distinction. Very interesting. Regardless of what he explicitly says, I'm claiming there is an argument for the distinction based on his uh, part whole conception of the composition of uh, senses. 
Now, one question here when we consider this strategy is, uh, is the force content distinction really tenable? And some people in this room have, uh, uh, and as aware, have argued recently, for instance, that it is not really tenable. So Peter Hanks have argued that it is uh, nothing less than uh, incoherent. If he's right, the force content distinction gives no answer to the paradox of negation. Another question is, even if we admit that the force content distinction is coherent and tenable, does it really avoid the paradox of negation? And I won't go into this, but I will say just a couple of things. That um, an interesting thing about the passage from Russell that I read at the beginning is that he's talking about a non-psychological notion of assertion that applies at the level of Russellian propositions, which are completely money dependent. So if we consider the realm of Russellian propositions, Russell thought that we must distinguish between asserting and unasserted propositions out there independently of any mental or linguistic act. So we don't find something like that in Frege. In Russell, I think uh, the problem that the force content distinction as we find it in Frege, which has to do with mental or linguistic acts uh, seeks to solve, uh, is relocated at the level of the contents, the mind independent contents of mental or linguistic acts. So we have a new force content distinction, a non psychological force content distinction, which seeks to resolve that problem. And here, when I was working at this paper, I thought I had a cool argument to show that, in fact, uh, you know, we embark in an infinite regress of force content distinctions where, uh, you know, at each stage, the problem is the paradox of negation is relocating and we need a new force content distinction to address it. But uh, unfortunately, I don't think I have the argument clear yet. So um, I will leave that out. What I'm going to do in this talk uh, I, is that I'm just going to assume that, uh, suppose that we don't want uh, the force content distinction. Suppose that even just for you know exploring options, suppose we don't want the force content distinction. Is there an, some other way of avoiding the paradox of negation? And one strategy, I think, is modeling propositional embedding on the composition of reference as Frege conceived. So according to this strategy, there is no appeal to the force content distinction. We can safely assume that uh, what Professor Ekanati called the Aristotelian view, that uh, uh, you know, anything true or false uh, is intrinsically forceful or judgmental or assertory. So to think or say that P just is to judge and assert that P. But then we model the compositions of judgments and assertions on the composition of reference. So if we take not P, which on this view is a judgment or assertion, what is going on with the P there? So the P on this view expresses an assertion or judgment, but is only an intermediate step toward the final assertion not P. The final result has no memory of the intermediate step, hence no inconsistency, no paradox of negation. And the view is supposed to work on this analogy, consider the expression the capital of Sweden, which refers to Stockholm. What is going on with Sweden, the word Sweden there? Well, here it refers to the country Sweden but it's only an intermediate step toward the final reference, namely Stockholm. The final result has no memory of the intermediate step. I think this strategy can be seen in some recent uh, attempts to rethink uh, or propose alternatives to the force content distinctions, distinction. And I will mention three examples. The clearest, perhaps, uh, is the account offered by Holm and Schwartz uh, in their paper, Embedding Speech Act Propositions, uh, Synthes 2020. 
So their proposal is based on the notions of successive predications and relativized commitment. So if we consider not P in their view, the P there is a forceful predication. But the commitment to its truth is relativized. Only the final predication, not P, is non-relativized. So we are provisionally committed to P, but ultimately only committed to not P. Another example, I think, is uh, um, some passages, I don't claim all of what uh, Peter Hanks has written on this topic, but some passages of what uh, Peter Hanks has written. And uh, consider these passages, this passage, he writes, to say that an act of predication has been canceled does not mean that no act of predication has taken place, nor that it has been retroactively eliminated, nor does it mean that the act of predication is somehow partial or incomplete. And here is his slogan, Cancer predication is not less than full-fledged predication, if I think it is more than predication. And here I propose one way, I don't claim that this is what Peter explicitly maintains or has written, but one way of understanding Hank's slogan is this, that the more that features in the slogan is the more of successive steps, keeping no memory of the earlier steps. So in not P, the P is a forceful predication, but in this context, its force is canceled, he says. And my exegetical proposal about, you know, Hank's exegesis is that uh, the P here is only a stage toward the performance of another predication, which keeps no memory of the earlier stages. And the final example, of another person in the room today, uh, Michael Schmitz, um, in his uh, forthcoming paper, Force Content and the Varieties of Unity, which uh, proposes an account base of the notion of higher level acts. So on his view, if we take not P, the P here expresses an assertion, but this, not, but this does not cause any inconsistency in the higher level act of negation why? Well, one way of understanding his view is that the P is only an intermediary step toward the performance of the final act, which bears no memory of the earlier stages. Now, I don't think that the referential model works. One immediate objection is to say that simply assertion just is not like reference. Assertion sticks. If you assert that P, the commitment to P, to P is being the case, stays with me until I change my mind. If I also assert that not P, then unless I have changed my mind, I contradict myself. Now this just direct objection I don't know, it might, I don't think it might not work for, with an advocate of the referential model because they might say that this just backs the question because the alleged intuition that the objection is supposed to express uh, is simply on their view an expression of the unwarranted assumption that assertions compose on the part whole model, which is precisely what they are contesting. Now, how could we make dialectical progress here? Well, one way would be to show that the stickiness of assertion follows from some more fundamental or less controversial features of assertion. Now, I don't know how to do that, but I will follow a different route and give an independent argument against the referential model, namely that it does not vindicate a basic feature of propositional embedding which I will call the requirement of negation. 
I focus here as on negation as the simplest case of a truth functional embedding, even though you can formulate similar uh, points uh, by considering this junction or you know, the conditional and other connectives. So the requirement of negation is that in order to think or say or understand that not P, one must be able to think or say or understand that P. If we consider reference, we see that what we might call the forgetfulness of reference composition goes hand in hand with the fact that there is no internal relation between the final result and the previous stages. We can get the same result through different stages. You know, we can refer to Stockholm by using the capital of Sweden or the city where Nobel prizes are awarded or simply by using Stockholm. In each case, we are perfectly well referring to Stockholm. And there is no reason why in order to refer to Stockholm, we must be able to refer to say Sweden. It's conceivable that one, you know, has always, has always only heard of Stockholm in connection with the Nobel Prizes awards and has no idea as, you know, even of the existence of Sweden. So this person will still be able to refer to Stockholm as the city where Nobel prizes are, are awarded, even though he cannot refer to it uh, as uh, the capital of Sweden. By contrast, one cannot think or say or understand that not P without being able to think or say or understand that P. And the referential model that's my objection, does not explain this contrast. It's precisely the forgetfulness of reference, which uh, was a kind of, which was appealing in order to avoid the paradox of negation. But that forgetfulness goes again, goes hand in hand with the idea that there is no internal relation between the final result and the previous stages, and thus we cannot satisfy what I call the requirement of negation. Okay, so I've formulated an apparent paradox, and I've considered so far two responses to this paradox, the more widespread and traditional one, which holds that propositions composed on the part whole model and avoids the paradox by invoking the force content distinction. Now, uh, this response definitely satisfies the requirement of negation. Why? Well, because on this view, when you think or say not P, you are actually thinking you're saying P. So obviously, if you are actually thinking or saying P, you must be able to think or say P. So the requirement of negation is forcefully satisfied here. Now, does it actually avoid the paradox? Well, I raised some questions about this. I leave this question open. The second strategy that I have considered holds that um, propositions composed not on the part whole model, but on the model of Fragian reference. And this strategy rejects the force content distinction and holds that propositions are intrinsically forceful. There is a commitment here to what Francois called the Aristotelian view. Now, this view, if tenable, would definitely avoid the paradox in virtue of what I've called the forgetfulness of reference. But the view, I think, is not viable because it does not satisfy the requirement of negation. And what I'm going to do in the next, uh, in the last part of this talk, which will take about five minutes, is to propose a third model of composition for uh, propositional embedding or to outline it. A, a model which uh, avoids the paradox of negation while also satisfying the requirement uh, of negation. 
Well, it is the view that um, Francois was referring to uh, in his talk uh, before. It's a view that I um, put forth in a paper in Synthes called the Propositional Complexity and the frege gitch Point. Um, so this view builds uh, on uh, Francois's notion of simulation of uh, an assertion of judgment. The main difference, as uh, uh, Francois noticed before, is that uh, I argue uh, is that my simulations are not truth valuable. So the view rejects the force content distinction, holds on to the Aristotelian view uh, by maintaining that anything truth valuable is also forceful. So what happened on this view in not P? The P here expresses the simulation of an assertion of judgment, which is neither forceful nor truth available. The simulation that P is part of the judgment of assertion that not P. So that means that part of what we do when we judge or assert that not P is to simulate the judgment or assertion that P. On this view, there is a contrast between, on the one hand, the judgment or assertion that P, which is forceful and truth available, and on the other hand, the simulation of the judgment or assertion that P, which is neither forceful nor truth available. Yet, these are not apples and oranges, two things that have nothing to do in common with one another. There is an internal relation between them. Specifically, two is conceptually dependent on one. You cannot simulate X unless you can do X. You cannot understand the simulation of X unless you can understand X. So we can say that simulating assertions or judgments is a derivative capacity, or perhaps we can also say, if it makes any difference, uh, that it is a derivative exercise of the very same capacity to judge or assert. So on this view, how do propositions compose? Not on the part whole, where a proposition is something true or false. Not on the part whole model, like Frigian sense. Not as stages, toward memory-less final results as a Frigian reference, but simulations of propositions occur as parts of other propositions. So the part whole model here has application, but it applies to, to the relation between simulations of propositions, which are neither forceful nor truth viable, and propositions, which are both truth viable and forceful. By contrast, on the Frigian and standard view, the part whole model applies to the relation between forceless truth available proposition. So I conclude by showing briefly how we satisfy our two desideratas here, avoiding the paradox of negation and um, satisfying the requirement of negation. The view avoids the paradox of negation because there is no inconsistency between judging and asserting that not P and simulating the judgment and assertion that P. These are not incompatible attitudes or performances. And the proposal satisfies the requirement of negation for the following reasons. Well, notice that on this proposal, you cannot judge or assert that not P without simulating the assertion judgment that P. This follows from the compositional model, which is part of this proposal. But you cannot simulate the assertion or judgment that P without being able to judge or assert that P. This follows from the derivative character of simulation. Hence, you cannot judge or assert that not P without being able to judge or assert that P, which is the requirement of negation. That's it. I look forward to discuss it with you. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? Um, 
Mitchell Green. And can you keep your hands up? Yeah, oh, sorry, yeah, you may take them out. Thanks, Silver. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, just as really a request for clarification to try to make sure I understand your view. You said that the embedded propositions are not truth of valuable, I think. Right. Even if we simulate some things when we embed those propositions. So what I'm not understanding is how that's going to work when we want to evaluate the truth value of a complex proposition that someone, for example, asserts. That is to right. say, if I assert that if P then Q, or assert that Joe believes that P, it sounds like the embedded propositions lack truth value, but I would have thought that we need to ascribe truth values to them in order to calculate the truth right. values yeah. of the complex. I don't see that, that there's room for that on your position um, because it seems to me that you have to accept that those embedded propositions have truth values in order to calculate the truth values of the yeah. complexes. Yeah. So I feel like I'm missing something. Yeah, th thank you very much. So on my view, the truth value of, let's say, P or Q depends on the truth value of the propositions which are simulated by the P and the Q that occurs in P or Q. So there is still compositionality, but uh, you know, the truth value of P or Q does not depend on, tr on the truth value of the P or Q that, occur that occur as parts of P or Q. It depends on the truth value of the prepositions which are simulated by the simulations occurring as parts of P or Q. Yeah, I don't understand that characterization though, because it sounds like you're both kind of saying with one thing, which you're giving with one thing, which you're taking, oh, taking away with the other hand or something like that. Because it seems like you do have to admit that the embedded propositions do have truth values, even if they're given truth values in some simulationist way but you explicitly deny that they have truth values mm -hmm. when they're embedded. So I don't see how you can have it both ways. Thank you, I, I, I'll try another time. So if I say, if I assert not P, yeah. on my view, part of what I do is to simulate the assertion that P. Now, the truth value of my assertion not P depends on the truth value of the assertion that I simulate, but I don't, but I do not perform that assertion when I assert not P. I only simulate that assertion. But, it's a, but you do agree that the embedded propositions that you simulate have truth value? Well, they have to, don't I, they? Do, I do agree that the simulation, that the proposition that I simulate yeah. has truth value, okay. but that is not embedded in my assertion, what, is, what occurs as part of my assertion is the simulation of that proposition. Yeah, we're just worried that then that there's gonna be an equivocation between propositions as types, which they only are, and tokenings of things that express propositions like sentences. And I can see how you might want to deny that those tokenings, those sentences are gonna have, are, are go deny that they have truth value. But it seems like the propositions as types, which is what they only could be, always are gonna have truth value on your, or anybody's view that can make sense of the possibility of compositionality. Hmm. Yeah, on my view, when I say not P, mm -hmm. that's an assertion, and I'm not tokening the archetype of uh, asserting P. I'm, if I, you know, if you like, I'm tokening an archetype of simulating the assertion that P. And the truth value of my act, uh, the, you know, my assertion that not P depends on the truth value of what I simulate, which does not occur as a part of my assertion. Yeah. I, I'm, I feel I'm just repeating myself, so I, I'm sorry if I'm not making progress. <laughs> yeah, I'll just have to think about your answer and see if I can <laughs> reformulate my, my objection, because I'm not seeing how there's a coherent position there, but that might just be my... I, I appreciate your question very much. Um, Eric Mandelbaum. Thanks, that was a really fun talk. Uh, again, clarificatory question. I'm just confused as to how this next part's supposed to work. Um, so I'm gonna give you an example and I was hoping you could walk me through um, how you understand the example. So if I give you a metaphoric phrase uh, like um, lawyers or sharks and then give you um, a lexical decision task, 
you'll be facilitated on um, semantically appropriate phrases. So um, lawyers are sharks or doctors are butchers. Uh, doctors are butchers will prime clumsy, um, but not precise. But if I give you the negated phrase, so um, doctors are not butchers, you'll prime both clumsy and precise. Um, now that's just priming, uh, but that priming shows you, I would have thought, something about both the construction of the sentence and one's penchant for acting um, on those primes looks like it's raised in the negation case towards being equally likely uh, to have thoughts about clumsiness and preciseness, um, but not in the asserted case. So wanting to deny that there was something asserted there seems, in the negated case, seems okay, uh, but I was wondering how, how you'd want to understand this datum, what sort of things you think are, are happening, or maybe you think this case is just um, one that's uh, orthogonal. Yeah, thank you very much. So I've been thinking about this proposal just in the very narrow scope of truth functional embedding, the very simple case. So I haven't thought about it. So does your question, I'm afraid and I have not really understood your question, does it rely on particular features of metaphors or, or not? No, no, no. The reason why there's a metaphor ah, okay. there is just to take away the, um, the, any, any very basic semantic priming that would go just to over association. So if I said, for example, um, you know, something is not an elephant versus something is an elephant, elephant's going to prime animal just because of the, the meaning of the terms. But doctors are butchers primes clumsy and precise, not because of any of the individual elements, but because you're forming the full thought of what that means. And then the prime is coming off of what looks to be uh, the proposition that is uh, emergent, not from any of the given elements, but from the meaning of the sentence as a whole, both the negated and unnegated parts. Mm. I see. So the, the worry is that it, it looks to be the same both. Yeah, I'm afraid I, I don't I have to think about this <laughs> this point. Yes. That I, is totally fair. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Cheers. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Peter Tiger. Thank you. I was beginning to wonder whether I had any question left. Um, but but uh, okay, let let me uh, put it this way. Um, the model of explanation uh, that you propose by, by um, uh, using simulation uh, simulations as the parts uh, would work equally well if you uh, replaced simulation with any uh, meaningless verb, like to dog. So you don't really assert the parts, but you dog the parts. Uh, and uh, the dogged parts are related, related to the propositions which have truth values. And um, you avoid both the uh, sense uh, uh, force content distinction and, and uh, the view that, that the parts are asserted. So, um, I guess I don't see exactly what role simulation as such play in this model. It, you, since you can uh, replace simulation by uh, just about anything that's not assertion and can well, take a propositional com complement. Well, it has to. Um, in, well, there has to be an internal relation between the simulation and what it simulates. I cannot just put anything there. I mean, it's essential that uh, if I say not P, that you understand which assertion I am simulating because the truth value of my assertion not P is going to depend on the truth value of the assertion that is simulated. If I say not, uh, you know, boo, boo, boo. Uh, then, yeah, but th that feature yeah. was preserved in my alternative. If you say you dog that P, or balls that P, that also has the, the P in there. 
Mm. Could you just um, just reformulate the proposal? Then I feel I have missed it. So the the idea was that that your model of um, avoiding the negation paradox and satisfying the negation requirement consisted in using some other type, act type, as parts that are not assertion. Right. So I was wondering what role especially simulation plays in this model, because I think right. simulation could be replaced by any um, verb whatsoever that take propositional complement, even if it don't doesn't mean anything. You get you get the same account if you say uh, the parts are doggings that pee. So the the special uh, idea of simulations as having some kind of force element simply is an idle wheel in your model. That's the uh, idea. I see. Yeah, I'm. I'm yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how the the, the 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 alternative proposal that you you put forth an objection. I mean, would get the internal relation between the. I mean, the role, the, the reason why simulations is important is that if you understand the simulation, you are thereby, uh, you are thereby understanding what it simulates. And um, without the simulation having to include as a part of something truth available. So if we try to do this uh, in the other way that you were suggesting, where we have a propositional attitude verb and a proposition, well, I, I don't want that proposition to be something truth available there occurring as a part. So uh, in, in order to have my view, I would still have to say that that propositional attitude verb, uh, you know, it's composed with the simulation of a proposition, which is something truth available. Okay, I, I think okay. I can see it. Thank you. And thank you. Um, Michael Schmitz. Yeah, uh, thank you, Silva. Uh, thank you for your talk. And uh, thank you for discussing my view. I think you misunderstand it. And I think there's no paradox of negation. So let me start with that. Taking a page from the folks, I think we don't, people don't usually notice any anything paradoxical if, for example, you say you deny an assertion or you reject an assertion or even you negate an assertion. And I think the folk are right and as philosophers we get sort of like hypersensitive and think we can't say that. We must say it's a proposition and a proposition is something like fundamentally different. Um, so the way you presented this was, as I understand it, is to say, well, what you're doing is like you're proposing, I'm performing an assertion and then I perform, say, an act of negation, and I kind of cross it out, and so and no trace, uh, left, a trace is left uh, of that. And, and I think if that was the view, you would be right to reject it, but I think the idea is, uh, is different. Uh, the idea is you perform the higher level act, negating, negating, conditionalizing, disjoining, asking a question, and I think this higher level act shifts the meaning of the force indicator and has a new function now. You don't perform an act of assertion, but for example, you perform an act of denying an assertion, and so the force indicator has the function to indicate that you're denying an assertion as opposed to a direction. Yeah, so often in these discussions, people don't pay attention to the uh, practical um, acts, and I think that this contributes uh, to the problem. Um, but if you do that, you can see it always has uh, this function, yeah? So I reject an assertion, 
So I need to specify that's an assertion that I reject. Or I can join two assertions as opposed to two directions. So I need force indicators to, uh, to specify that. And I ask a question. So I think you can ask theoretical questions such as, is the door closed? And practical questions like, close the door. Yeah, and so then it's not like you, you first perform an assertion and then you're questioning that assertion's crossing it out or something like that. But you ask a question and the force indicator specifies whether you present an assertion or direction to the audience or, or to, to your hearers or even to yourself uh, because that's the, what you're interested in. It's a way of presenting an assertion and you want a yes, no response or you want uh, a completion like who did something uh, like in, with so-called WH questions and so on. So it seems to me if we really see we have to start from the higher level act and then see the, the forceful act as having a different function. Yeah? So, so as I like to put it, uh, the higher level act shifts the meaning of a force indicator into this new context it creates, then it seems to me we can understand this and uh, avoid uh, the, the paradox of negation or any other paradox. You could say the Frege point is the paradox of the conditional or the paradox of, of uh, fiction and so on. Right, thank you very much, Michael. Um, so you talk about when I, you say that when I assert not P, I present uh, the act of assertion that P. And I understood that at least in the paper that I mentioned, your view was that the way I present it is that I actually perform it. Whereas perhaps I, I, you know, I misunderstood your view. Your view. I, I have to, yes, I mean, we can discuss specific passages you know, of your paper. That that's what how I understood your view, and uh, but uh, you know if we if you don't go that way, I mean in the, at that general level of description, I mean that's also the view that I would like to defend. But I say that the way I present the act of assertion is by simulating it, and uh, you know Indrek here has proposed another view that the way I you know I specify the act of assertion is through these. Uh, object while you know quasi referential uh, but not really referential uh, um, act uh, you know which involves like a practical mode of presentation which perhaps is just a notational variant of my simulation you know because um, yeah so, um, so so maybe i understand i mean perhaps you know thank you perhaps i misunderstood your view i understood that in that paper the way you thought the way you claim that we present the um, assertion that I negate in the higher level act, in the higher level act is by actually performing the assertion. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I may not have expressed myself uh, clearly. It's an, I think it's all an older version, I think that, uh, that, that you're referring uh, to. Mm -hmm. I do think you perform uh, the act of using the force indicator, but, but uh, the idea is in the context created by using a negation operator or any other logical operator or, an inter or fictional markers and such things that shifts the meaning uh, of the force indicator, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. And then of course, uh, regarding the beginning of your you know, remarks, I, I, of course I agree that there is no paradox of negation in the sense that it's an apparent paradox, like you know, usually philosophical paradoxes are. <laughs> like, yeah. Peter Hanks. Silver, hi. Uh, hi. Thanks for the paper. It, it, I think it's an ingenious view. It strikes me as, as heroic in some ways. Um, but the thing that worries me about it, and it's also a worry I have about Indrik's view, is that um, it conflicts with, I think of it as a kind of semantic innocence, intuition. You know, the idea that a declarative sentence can appear as the antecedent of a conditional or can appear inside negation. And when it does so, it does not change its meaning. Nor does, uh, do, like, when you use a declarative sentence inside a negation, you use it to do the same sort of thing that you would do with it when it appears outside of negation. Right? You're not changing the meaning or role or function of a sentence by plugging it inside a conditional or inside negation. 
And on your view, you're giving up that. You're saying something very different happens with the declarative sentence when it appears after not than when it appears unembedded. And that, that conflicts with this innocence assumption. I mean, maybe that goes on with belief sentences. You know, maybe something weird happens in a belief sentence when you plug a sentence inside of that clause. But belief sentences are, you know, hyper-intentional. And we're talking about not here. It's as extensional as you can get. Yeah, so that's the worry I have about, about right. the view. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. In a way, my view is uh, not innocent, uh, like, you know, Frege's, you know, because Frege's also, th uh, well, uh, oh, no, you're right. That, that, that applies to intentional context. You're right, not to, um, yes, you're right. Because for intentional context, uh, Frege thinks that, uh, you, know, you, you know, language is systematically ambiguous, that the reference is the normal sense. Right. Uh, whereas I, I, I hold a, a similar, yes, my view entails a similar switch for even complete extension. For context. not. <laughs> for experience, right. just for uh, yeah, not, yeah, 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 exactly, 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 yes. I mean, the background of this view is um, kind of in a fundamental disagreement with Frege about um, uniformity of logical complexity. So Frege pursues what, you know, what seems like a paradise of, of logical uniformity. Everything behaves at the same level at the, you know, if we take the, you know, the, the capital of Stockholm, the capital of Sweden, the capital of Sweden is charming, the capital of Sweden is not charming. So like we have a functor, we have a concept, we have a truth functional connected, everything behaves in the same way. And um, um, yes, the background of my view is that with uh, sentences, the scene really changes and the fundamental mode of composition changes. So, so this doesn't really answer your objection. It's uh, more like that. Um, um, perhaps it, it's, uh, my answer is like this, that the uh, semantic innocence there uh, depends on the assumption of uh, a, a uniformity of logical complexity at the subsentential level and at the sentential level, which I think uh, is wrong. Yeah. Just a, a quick follow-up. I mean, one of the... One of the problems, problems or consequences of Frege's rejection of innocence is the hierarchy of senses. You know, when you get multiple embeddings, you need secondary, tertiary, you know, you need all right. these, you get this hierarchy of senses. This is sort of inchoate, but I suspect something similar is going to happen on your view. You get simulations yeah. of simulations and then simulations of simulations of simulations. I've, I've... Yeah, what I mean? I, I've, been, I've been thinking about this. Uh, thank you, Peter. I mean, I think I can hold the view that I only simulate the atomic sentences once, you know, and, um, and so I only need the one level of simulation. Right, good. That's what you want. The question is... Okay. Yeah, yeah, right, right, <laughs> yeah. right, 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 right. But yes, that's, a, that's a, a good question and a potential problem, yeah. When I say not, not be, am I... Simulating a simulation of an assertion? Yeah, because not P is simulating P. When I say not, not P, am I, yes. Am I simulating not P and uh, simulating the simulation of P? Well, I don't want to say that. Right. I want to say, no, I'm only simulating P. And um, yeah, maybe actually just for the sake of disclosure, a problem this, if we, it's considered double negation, I wonder whether my view has a problem analogous to the paradox of negation, actually, <laughs> because, uh, you know, the paradox of double negation, because, uh, you know, when I say not, not P, on my view, I'm simulating P. So I'm at the same time simulating P and asserting P, and aren't these two attitudes inconsistent, you know, so. Yes, yeah, good. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't have anyone else on my list. I, I have a comment actually just on this last point. Um, so one kind of case that you might think is a case where semantic innocence fails is just with ordinary quantifiers. So if I have a sentence like, he loves his mother, um, 
so that expresses some proposition, but uh, when you embed that under a quantifier or something a little bit more complex, like every boy is such that he loves his mother, um, it seems like, so now that those pronouns inside are now bound, and so he loves his mother as it occurs there or doesn't say what it says when it's standalone. Right. Um, but that, that case seems like unproblematic because uh, it really doesn't seem like wh whatever the, log the, lo the logical relations between those two sentences are going to turn out to be fine, even though in some sense innocence fails. Um, so one, pr one question about innocence is this issue about hierarchy of uh, senses. But another one would just be like, does it preserve the right logical relations, right? So if you have if P then Q, if the P that occurs there, so if I have if P then Q, and then I assert P, right, I, I'm like obligated to assert Q, or if I reason from if P then Q and P to Q, that's a good piece of reasoning. Um, but you know, you had that quote from Russell at the beginning where he says, well, actually the, the P that's in the if P then Q isn't really the standalone P. I'm not sure exactly what he meant, but there's a worry there that then when you're reasoning, right, just modus ponens, you're somehow equivocating and it's not clear why you should be licensed right. to reason in that way. But I, yeah, I couldn't yeah. really tell from the, your setup. Because on your view, you know, that if P, that part is going to be a simulation of an assertion. And then when I just say P, that's going to be an assertion. I don't know how to think about the logical relations between those things. Right. So, um, yes, yeah, it is my view that... Uh, um, Avoiding equivocation in a case where, like in the modest ponens, ponens, and avoiding equivocations in a case like, um, uh, you know, uh, every F is G, A is F, therefore A is G. There it is essential that the A, which is a substantial element, you know, has, you know, is the same part, you know, has the same role. And uh, on my view, Avoiding equivocations in these two cases, where the second case where substantial elements are involved and they have to reoccur, and avoiding equivocation in the case of a, a modus ponens uh, is different. So exactly like uh, the assumption that uh, which is Gitch's argument that in the argument in the modus ponens the p and the q that occur in the premises in the conclusion must be the same right depends on the assumption that uh, on on the assumption of this logical uniformity such that uh, uh, you know, he models modus ponens on an inference like, uh, you know, every F is G, A is F, therefore A is G. And I'm saying these two are different. So, you know, avoiding equivocation in the case of modus ponens, uh, what, what that involves is that, uh, um, so I, I have if P then Q, P, in order to avoid equivocation, it's essential that the P that occurs in the second premise is a simulation um, no, I'm sorry, what is essential for avoiding equivocation is that the embedded P is a simulation of the P that occurs as the second premise. You don't need the P to be the same. So, so I, yes, my account, thank you for your question, uh, does entail a different explanation of uh, uh, inferences like modus ponens and inferences like um, um, yeah, syllogistic inferences where we have substantial elements. And this again is another um, side of my general point that uh, with uh, sentences, everything changes logically. Yeah. Oh, Indrik. Hi, Silver. Hi, Indrik. Loved your talk. Um, so it's not really. I don't really even want to ask a critical question. I want to try to come to your defense a little bit. So, uh, so, so it relates to Mitch's question, which is also like the sort of question I've asked you before when I first read your comment, or sorry, your paper. But then, since you sort of mentioned that our views might be like notational variants, um, it's like I think it would be interesting to point out that compared to, say, Peter Hanks or Francois, 
we're like way more Phrygian in the way that composition is supposed to work. We basically have the note, something like the notion of entertaining a proposition or grasping a proposition. And that's sort of what embedding runs of, right? Like your simulated assertion is like entertaining a proposition in the sense that the entertaining itself doesn't have a truth value. The entertaining is neutral, right? So your simulation is neutral. But of course the proposition that is there is still going to be truth evaluable because it's constituted by the, or it's, it's this judgment type. You just get that it in this neutral manner. So in this way, sort of, one might think that actually the sort of view we hold or you just presented is, sh should be much more acceptable to the, those wedded to the traditional content force distinction insofar as embedding goes. Uh, so yeah, I just sort of wanted you to have a chance to comment on this. Right. Well, the, the traditional Frege, however, wants, uh, wants the forceless thing to have be true or false. So, and that's where we disagree, so. Well, no, yeah, so I would, I mean, the way, like the way you differ is sort of in explaining how truth and falsity comes into the scene, right? So it's like the judgment first picture. But when it comes to embedding, all the force is lost. You have something like the notion of entertaining a proposition, basically. It's just understood to be derivative from the basic case of judgment. So in your case, mm -hmm. you understand that notion as a simulation of assertion, which is supposed to be neutral, but the assertion itself is supposed to have the truth value. Right. So, and you know, in my case, I would say, yeah, you, you grasp the proposition quo the act type judgment, but in grasping, you're not taking any stance towards the proposition. So it's like this neutral attitude of entertaining. So the embedding runs exactly like on the Phrygian picture. You just give up the Phrygian picture that you, like that, you know, that's the basic case or, or explanation of truth conditions. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, so it's sort of, in, in that way, it's sort of like midway between Frege and like Hanks's view, so. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I understood Nietzsche's uh, question, that uh, objection that, um, you know, that P, that the QC not P must be itself true and false, whereas, uh, uh, that that's what I'm denying, right? It's um, so. Yeah, I mean, if you if you completely deny that, then then like I think Mitch's question is exactly the question I used to have about your view in the past, because I, I I sort of like don't deny that in a sense. I mean, like, oh, you don't? I see. Well, I mean, the, well, the grasping I mean, of the I, proposition I, is neutral and doesn't have a truth value, but the proposition grasp does have truth right, conditions. Right. 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 And I, I feel like that's the only way you can make sense of the thing too. And if you right. say, and if you do say that, then then it's just a notational variant, as you said, structurally, okay. structurally the same. But if you don't say that, then it's very hard to see how how you're supposed to get that the whole to get the whole you know to like what is the what is the negation supposed to operate on? Right. 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 Thank you, Indrek. I have to think more about Thanks. this. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, we have time for one more question, but if there are no more questions, we can. Okay, so why don't we thank Silver once again?